First Timothy chapter 5 continues with Paul giving Timothy some practical advice and some specific advice, both as a preacher and then things we can take and apply to ourselves as Christians as well. Uh, there's a lot of advice in this chapter related to the caring of those who are destitute, the caring of those who need help versus those who uh, may not need help and who have those around them who need to be caring for them and shame on them for not doing so. While also talking about those who may be acting as though they need help uh, with nefarious ulterior motives and uh, rebuking them for doing so. There's some good practical advice concerning Timothy as a young preacher and the way he should handle himself uh, as a preacher to the various kinds of members who are at uh, the congregation where he preaches. And then it ends with a strong discussion about uh, the elders who are overseeing the, uh, the congregation there where Timothy preaches and how uh, he needs to be careful how he treats his elders and treat them with respect. And at the end of it, he leaves uh, Timothy in the chapter with some good practical advice uh, on a personal level. And so that's the chapter in a nutshell. Let's just dive right in. Uh, Paul begins by saying, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. He continues by saying, The elder women as mothers, and the younger as sisters, uh, maintaining uh, with all purity. And so it's clear, based on the overall context of the beginning of the chapter, when he says, Rebuke not an elder, he doesn't mean the bishops of authority. He doesn't mean the uh, the pastors of a congregation, those who have those qualifications that are to be met in 1 Timothy 3. Rather, he means just older men. Now, elders are typically older men who meet qualifications, but these are just older men. And he's explaining how, as a younger preacher, he needs to look up to them and how he needs to treat also his peers who are young as well. Uh, and so he says, of the older men, treat them like fathers. Don't rebuke them too sternly or too harshly. Don't uh, insult them in any way. Um, obviously, there are going to be occasions when rebuking must be done, but he means if they despise you, going back to the previous chapter, for being young, don't retaliate. Don't rebuke them for being older. Rather, entreat them, uh, care for them as fathers, little f fathers. Younger men, those more to your peer, he says, treat them as brothers. Uh, elder women, treat them, obviously, like mothers with that kind of respect and uh, adoration. And also, he says, younger the younger ladies, treat them like your sisters, maintaining purity, with all purity. If brethren would listen to that phrase right there, we would avoid a lot of scandals that occur within the church. If preachers would listen to that, a lot of scandals could be avoided. Treat, these, treat your uh, women of the congregation like sisters, like, like, the, the, like physical sisters, your earthly sisters. Treat them like sisters. Honor widows that are widows indeed, that is, widows who are truly in need. A widow indeed is a widow in need, and vice versa. Those who have no one to care for them at all, those who have lost all family and they are just poor, elderly, and alone, care for them, honor them, give them the kind of, um, uh, not just love and affection, not just kind of um, uh, availability, you know, as, as comfort, but rather give them the financial support that they need as well. If any widow have children or nephews, let them, let them, the children or nephews, learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Those are not widows in, in deed. Those are widows in, uh, in technical terms. They have no husbands, so they're widows, but they have children. They have nephews. They have people who can take care of them. They need to learn, those children, to take care of their parents. If they don't do so, shame on them. But they need to take care of them so the church doesn't have to be burdened with taking care of them, so the church can take care of those who are in need. Verse 5. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusts God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. A widow indeed is the one you should care for, is the one you should care for is the one who has maintained her Christian life. That even though she's lost so much, she has maintained her her uh, trust in God, her supplications and prayers toward God night and day at all times, and yet she is in need, and so she should be helped. On the other hand, verse 6, she that lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. Those who have lost their husbands and their families and they've gone back to the world, look, you help them who you can, how you can help them, help who you can help, but the church should not be burdened with helping those who don't want to repent and turn back to God, these, these sisters who have abandoned Christ. Verse 7, and these things give in charge, that is, these things you repeat, you give in charge, that is, you charge the brethren to do so as well, that they may be blameless, that those who would ask for help 
would ask for help with pure hearts and with penitent attitudes. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. If there's a father who won't take care of his children, if there's children who won't take care of their parents when they're older, they have denied the faith because that is a, a principal idea behind the Christian theology is to help others who need help. And if you refuse to help those who need help and who want to do right, then you have denied the faith. You're worse than a person who's never obeyed the gospel. Translated here as infidel, a non-believer. Let a widow be taken into the number, let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, 20, 40, 60, three score years, 60 years old, having been a wife of one man. Don't take in someone who is young enough that they can marry again. Don't take in someone who is young enough that they can take care of themselves still. Uh, and don't take in someone who is an adulteress or a polygamist, someone who's followed the pagan religions of the world around them, and one of their husband has died, and they have other husbands or potential other husbands. No, help those who truly need help is his point. Verse 10, well, we, well reported of for good works are the kinds of women you should be taking and helping. If she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work, that's the kind of character of a person who, if they need help, the church should be jumping to help, reaching out to help. And look at what he says again. Brought up children, raised and nurtured children in the admonition of the Lord that has been a godly mother. If she's the kind of woman who has lodged strangers, she's been hospitable, washed the saints' feet, someone who has been a servant, these, these phrases are used to apply in that way. If she has relieved the afflicted, if she has helped others, by all means help her. If she has diligently followed every good work, if she has served Christ in every way that she can, and yet she needs help, by all means help her. But the younger widows refuse. It sounds like harsh language when he says refuse. He just means steer them in another direction. The younger widows can be helped in other ways so that the church can help those who can only be helped by the church. Younger widows refuse, steer away. Uh, not, not like away from fellowship, but just to other sources of help, he means. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. He says there are some who might take advantage of you and who will um, uh, use the hospitality of the church for their own gain, uh, not seeking help, uh, not needing help that they seek. They have damnation on their conscience because they have cast off their first faith. These who have rejected Christianity and yet who still require the help of the church. Well, they need to repent to God first. And with all they learn to be idle, he's continuing to rebuke these kinds of women who would take advantage of uh, Christianity's help. They learn to be idle. They don't do anything for themselves, though they could. With all about from house to house, they're just wandering about from house to house, um, you know, seeking help from them and then moving on to help from them. When they could be helping themselves, they just go from house to house. Not, uh, not only idle, but tattlers, busybodies, speaking things which they ought not, just gossiping, uh, speaking evil of other people, asking for help when they don't need it, that sort of character. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry so that this doesn't become them, he says. I want them to marry so that they can start their lives over again. Marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. This, verse 14, is the contrast to verse 13. These women who seek help when they don't need it, and so they just wander from house to house, tattling and babbling and speaking evil. He says, instead of that, why don't you just... Get married again. You've lost a husband. Well, get married again. If you need help, a husband can help. And then you can, instead of being an idle mind, you can raise children again. You can keep a house again. You can give none occasion to the adversary, the devil, who seeks to lead you away from uh, what is right, like these women from the previous verse. People like to take verse 14 out of its context and say, look at Paul the chauvinist. No, it's a contrast to verse 13. He's saying, instead of doing that, why don't you do this? You claim to need help. Well, here's how you can help yourself. Verse 15, for some are already turned aside to Satan. He says to Timothy, there are some you might be helping who might be seeking your help who don't need your help. And they are just using you and taking advantage of you. Be wary. If any man or woman that believes has widows, let them relieve them. If there are Christians at your congregation, those that believe, there are Christians, and they have widows, let them relieve them. If they know someone who is in need, if it's a family member, they have widows, a mother, a father, a son, or a daughter who is in need, let them help their family, their physical family. Let not the church be charged. Why? 
so that the church may relieve them that are widows indeed, as we've already defined widows indeed, those who have no one to help them. The church should be helping them so that those who have others to help them can help be helped by them. It's not that the church doesn't want to help. It's that the church can only do so much. And so the church ought to be focusing its attention and its resources on those who have nobody. So let those who have somebody be cared for those who can't care for them. Now he turns his attention to the elders who rule, as he says here in verse 17. Let the elders that rule, as a contrast to verse 1 of chapter 5, let just the elders. Let the elder men respect. Of the elders that rule, of these older men who meet the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3, let those bishops be kind of worthy of double honor, especially those that work and labor in word and deed. Because they who labor and also teach and preach, and yet are elders, should also be paid as preachers are paid. Those who labor and teach and preach should receive a reward for that work that they do. Not that they do it in order to get the money. They're not greedy and filthy lucre. They're not desiring the money. But they should be rewarded. You see the opposite of desire. They should be rewarded for that, with that double honor. The first honor comes with respecting them as elders, as bishops, as pastors over the flock. But the second honor comes with even paying them, supporting them financially, so they can continue doing what they're doing. As he says in verse 18, the scripture says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. You feed the ox who, who works in the garden, and the laborer is worthy of his hire. You pay the servant to work in the fields because he does the work. Well, pay the elder who also teaches and preaches. Pay the elder, financially support them for the great work that they do, which is greater than any physical work that any man could do. They're shepherding souls. Verse 19, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. In other words, don't be so quick to hear what an elder has done wrong unless there is enough evidence against that elder. Elders aren't perfect. An individual bishop or an elder, even an eldership as a group, can make mistakes. An elder, an individual, can make a mistake. But we should give elders the benefit of the doubt. We should give all Christians that, certainly. But most, most importantly, an elder, as he has got the whole affairs and the burdens of the congregation on his shoulders, we should not just be so quick to hear an accusation against him. But when two or three witnesses come and say, look, at this elder is not doing right, then, verse, 19, or verse uh, 20, them that sin, those elders that sin, rebuke before all, that they may also fear. Now he says in verse 1, rebuke not an elder. He says in verse 20, rebuke an elder. Is that a contradiction? No, it's a different circumstance. Don't you, verse 1, rebuke an elder the way they rebuke you, for being old as they rebuke you for being young. That's not right or fair. But here in verse 19 and 20, if an elder has done something wrong, if an elder has sinned, then he ought to be rebuked, provided there is enough evidence against him. Two or three witnesses who have come forward and said, this elder has committed the sin. Then he tells the preacher, you have the authority of the word, use it and rebuke that elder. For what purpose? Rebuke him before all, because he's the elder of all, the congregation, so that the others may also fear, so that they will learn to respect God, the word, the office of the elder. Rebuke them if they do wrong. And there is enough evidence against them. I charge thee, this is how serious this is that Paul says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, I call heaven, he says, as witness, that you observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing but partiality. That's really the chapter in a nutshell. Because he says, don't treat younger members better than the older, or don't treat the older better than the younger. Treat everybody equally. And when it comes to the eldership, don't rebuke them without sufficient justification, without sufficient accusation made against them. But it's serious. Make sure you don't uh, uh, have favorites, play favorites one over the other. Verse 22, lay hands suddenly on no man. To lay hands on was um, the, the cultural symbol in those days of the, the, the transference of authority or the transference of power or the sign of approval from one to another. In other words, when an elder became an elder, when a person became a bishop of the flock, uh, or rather of the group of elders or bishops at a congregation, the hands would be laid on them by the other elders, or if they had none, um, by the men or by the apostle in the first century, to, to signify that this is now the one who has the authority over us, along with the group of elders or bishops. So he says, don't, don't too quickly lay hands on somebody. Don't too quickly appoint someone as an elder, because they may not be ready for it. As he said in chapter 3, not a novice, not someone who's unqualified, not someone who's unprepared. 
On the other hand, don't be too quick to hear an accusation against one either. Neither be a partaker of other men's sins. Someone might be coming to you in order to hurt an elder or a bishop for no reason. Don't be too quick to listen. Keep yourself pure. Stay out of the fray. Treat everyone equally, he says. Now he turns to the personal, from Paul to Timothy. He says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thy off affirmities. Uh, first of all, the word wine, as translated in the New Testament, is just oinos. And oinos in the Greek means literally that which is from the grape. It could mean the grape itself. It could mean the cluster of grapes. It could mean the juice squeezed from a grape. It could mean the juice squeezed from a grape and mixed with sugar, left to ferment and become alcoholic, as we think of alcohol. So the word is just translated very vaguely in the New Testament. There's a lot of words translated very vaguely, unfortunately, in the New Testament. So what he says here is, don't, no longer should you just drink water. Now why would Paul tell Timothy not to drink water? It seems that, Paul, uh, that Timothy has some kind of a stomach ailment. He has some kind of a, a, an, injure, uh, uh, an internal uh, condition. And so he's been trying to drink things for medicine and he's drinking water. Well, water in those days was very impure. Water in those days was very dirty. And a lot of times they would mix wine with water, grape juice, squeezed from the grape, grape juice, with water as a purifier. It would, it would um, being acidic, it would help purify the water. And that's how they would drink it. That's just the way they did it in the first century. So Paul says, don't just drink water straight up, but add a little wine, add a little oinos for your stomach's sake. Your Bible is replete with thousands of references, not thousands, hundreds of references to alcohol being sinful. He's not talking about alcohol here. It is grossly unfortunate that the word is translated wine, and when we think of the word wine, we think of the bottle of, of Chateau Bardot, or something you pop the cork and you pour it in a champagne glass. That's not this word. This word is just that which is from the grape. And he says, don't just drink water. It's impure. It'll hurt your stomach even more. But mix it. Mingle it with wine. Drink also oinos, that which is from the grape. He is not regulating, as some people would like, uh, social drinking. In fact, that's just the opposite. He doesn't tell him to drink wine. He says, D drink it socially. He says, drink it purely for medicinal purposes. Drink that from the grape for your medicinal purposes. You can really translate this word, don't drink water, but drink a little NyQuil for your stomach's sake. So it's a shame that it's been abused as it is, this verse, when it has nothing at all to do with what is called social drinking, which is really just drinking. And there's nothing social about it. There's nothing pleasant about it. This isn't talking about that. This is you drink a little grape juice for your stomach's sake. No longer water, but use a little. Use a little, that is to say, mix it with the water for your stomach's sake and your constant, your, your continual um, sicknesses. And then he ends it with verse 24 and 25, which is a very poetic um, end of this chapter. Some men's sins are open beforehand. Some men's wrongness is obvious to all and going before judgment. And some men follow after. Some are very secret and, and concealed in their wrongdoing. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand. Some it's very obvious who are doing good, and therefore some are doing good and it's not so obvious. But they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Eventually, those who are doing wrong will be found out, as he says. And that's how he ends chapter 5. Chapter 6, which we'll cover next week, is the last chapter of this uh, First Timothy letter. And even though Second Timothy obviously follows right after it, uh, as we study it, we're going to take our turn now to Titus after we finish First Timothy. That way we can cover Second Timothy last, as that was the last book uh, that Paul wrote. But we'll finish up this book here by noticing 1 Timothy chapter 6 this time next week while Paul uh, finishes his, his words of exhortation, his words of advice to this uh, great young preacher, Timothy. Until then, thank you so much.